who stood in with our, our keynote early will now begin to talk. It's all about distributed immutable data objects, or DIDO. So, uh, Ms. Douglas, over to you. Can you hear me? Coming out through there? Coming out through there? Huh? Okay. Um, so distributed uh, mutable data objects reference architecture, as I kind of alluded to in the earlier speech, or the earlier talk, was that uh, things like blockchain and distributed ledger and hash graphs are technologies, are, are ways of implementing these things. But what they're really doing is distributed mutable data objects. And there's lots of different ways of doing that. So we at the OMG in Mars uh, decided that we would have to, we wanted to get our handles, our, our grip on what it was that blockchains are, distributed ledgers are, and how it applied to standards. And kind of like the Christmas speech that uh, Chris gave earlier, you know, we were all, we had that, we could, oh, we could, we did that. We're experts. It's like, well, no, we're not experts. We don't really know what's going on. So we spent almost a year uh, developing this reference architecture. If this works. Ah! So, the following is the introduction. Uh, uh, so, this is the, from the paper. So, you can go online to the OMG and you can get to the paper. I um, encourage you to read it. Uh, we're starting to visualize the 1.1 version of the paper, uh, 1.2, whatever we're going to go with next. But there's a general overview of the Dido architecture, a detailed description of the proposed uh, reference architecture. And then, in each of the components of the architecture in the paper, if you go down far enough, you will see all the standards that we think apply to that component. And I think that last count, I think it was 145 different standards that we feel are applicable to the Dido uh, environment, the Dido space. And um, this is our, con our concept diagram of uh, relationships of the Dido concept software network. As you move across from the left to the right, uh, you have idealized requirements and constraints. You have st stakeholder data software requirements. What do I need from, from that perspective? Ultimately, that comes into what I would call an incarnation, which would be the blockchains, a distributed ledger, a hash graph, a tangle, a hypergraph, whatever that happens to be. I'm going to take those requirements and I'm going to make them into one of these things. And from there, I take the stakeholders uh, we had a, a young lady over here talking about utilities. And she would be the stakeholder of the Dino network requirements. And she wants to come in and say, OK, I'm going to use this. How do I use it? So we have these different communities that we have to deal with and, and work with. Um, so problems in La La Land. I want to just kind of point out some of the problems. Oh, I think we already did this one in, um, in the earlier talk. But CoinDash uh, and Ethereum was hacked. And so these were problems that we noticed, and we were like, well, some of these problems are things that we already have a rich set of standards that cover. That if they had followed good software engineering and used the, the IEEE uh, ISO standards on, on quality assurance, they wouldn't have had those problems. So that kind of brought it up. Uh, there's types of nodes for inter inter uh, interconnectivity. We were moving from the old centralized that visualized that was the, when we had the huge chunks of iron that ran uh, relational databases in one spot and everybody connected to that central server at the home office or whatever it was. Then you have decentralized and that's kind of where most of the world is right now. In decentralized you go to Amazon or Google or Microsoft and you get uh, a centralized server and then you have things that come off of it. But what the blockchain paper, uh, the um, uh, Nakamoto, some of whatever his name is, uh, paper kind of said was that we really want to go to a distributed network, which is that there is no master, there is no slave, there is no client, there is no server. Everybody is a peer. And we're going to be dealing peer to peer, and we're going to have these distributed, immutable data objects. Um, the immutable data object may be a ledger, it may be a contract, it may be a document, it may be who knows what it's going to be. We don't know at this point. The, the, the world is open. But when you start thinking about distributed uh, immutable data objects, the way an immutable data object works is I write a version, I don't know if any of you were ever on the old VAC systems, but when you wrote a file and you saved it, it automatically made a version number of it at the end. So if you save the file, 
a dot text and the next time it was <coughs> semicolon one the next time you edited the file you saved it it became semicolon two and it became semicolon three so it was doing versioning and then you deleted the old versions but an immutable data object is where I write something once and then I can, everybody can read it and the next time somebody comes in they say okay I edited this I have a new immutable data, data object which overtakes the, the previous one and now people can either use the first version or the second version and that's a management problem. That's a, a big issue that has to be resolved when you're setting up these communities. So we kind of, this is how we looked at uh, the Dino network uh, reference architecture, that we would have to support a network of, of nodes put together that are all concerned about one mutable data object. I mean, they may actually be involved in multiple networks, but they're involved in one prominent uh, mutable data object. So, but they're different types because some people have different roles. Like if you look at the Bitcoin world, uh, I think um, JT kind of re referred to, you had the role of a miner, and then you had the role of a ledger, and then you have the role of a wallet. So that would be the green, the pink, and the blue would be those three different types of nodes that are out there that are based off of the way that people want to access or use the data, the immutable data object. So that is the core of what we're, what's going to be built. There is no central server, there's no master, there's no place that I go to for the authoritative uh, thing. And that's done through consensus. So, um, oh, this, is, this slide did not get changed, but that's okay, I'll talk you through it. So we have a Dino ecosystem, and this is a very key slide to me of what we're trying to accomplish. So we have the Dido ecosystem, which is made up of Dido software. In the case, it could be Ethereum, it could be uh, uh, IOTA, it could be uh, Hyperledger from IBM, whatever. That's the Dido software. And those people usually are, fair, in order to be successful, they have a fairly disciplined approach for how to govern that software, how to build that software, and, problem, and, problem, and have um, uh, bug reports, and fix the bug reports, and enhancements and everything. So they're living in that Dido world, that Dido software world. Uh, we're referring to that now as the Dido platform, kind of mirroring, mirroring the um, OMG platform and domain. So that's the platform. They are going to be platform. There are a set of standards that probably need to be involved, involved, uh, evolved and created to help cover the Dido software platform. Then there's the Dido networks. And the dead on the, or, um, uh, domains. Sorry, we changed the name because we were getting networks everywhere. So it's the Dido domain, where it says network. And again, this goes back to the young lady who asked about the public utilities. She would be part of a Dido <coughs> domain. This the purple, I think that's purple, I'm color challenged. Purple box is here. That she would be part of one of those. And she would aggregate, I think somebody said the aggregation of frenemies where you get together. Um, but that, we need to have that community, and that, that's a separate issue. And they need their own standards for how to deal with their own data. They need their own things, and they don't necessarily, you know, they, they're going to use those platforms as tools. To them, they're just tools. They better work. They are going to have an interface. They're going to do certain things. They're going to call the API, or they're going to do whatever it is, and it's going to work. For them, they're tools. But they need to create their own uh, domain. So, for example, in the utility space, there is a group that is trying to build how to do uh, transformers and how to do uh, transmission lines and how to do uh, electric meters on houses and solar collectors and all of those types of things. So they're trying to figure out how that's all going to work. And they've kind of formed a, a community. I think that that's a perfect opportunity for people to come into OMG and say, I want to create my own um, domain network. My, my own um, Dido domain, and we're going to talk about, uh, it could be, um, uh, the one I gave yesterday is, my cousin is the world ar um, onion uh, expert, he arbitrages onions all over the world, and, trans and does onions, so from the field all the way out to the, the McDonald's that comes on your table, there's an onion, he's involved in that whole chain of trying to get onions from the field to the Table. So he might create the onion domain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
and, and, and get together with the other people in the Onion and that maybe they would use an IBM hyperledger type of supply chain type of solution for that. But to them, to that domain, that's just a tool. And they would like to have a standardization for how to deal with that tool. So as we go from the, 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 the purple boxes over to the yellow boxes, they would like to have a standard way of being able to interface with those things so those tools become more interchangeable, more, uh, you know, they, they, I think uh, JT alluded to the fact that there were different, you know, if, depending on what you wanted to do, you picked a different kind of platform. And he was, you know, Azure group were helping you figure out which platform you were doing and they were supporting different platforms. But as we all know, you might evolve and all of a sudden you pick a platform and you realize, well, that's the wrong platform because it's not really the best platform for what I've evolved into. So we need to be able to do that evolutionarily. And that's where the standards come into play. So the Dido, net, the Dido uh, uh, domains would be creating a standard for what it is to have to capture what an onion is, or what it is to capture what a, a transformer is, or let's say if you're, you're doing bill pay, or you're collecting solar, you know, solar, and the people are producing kilowatt hours, and, and you want to get the kilowatt hours, and so instead of doing that with bookkeeping, the traditional bookkeeping system, you're going to do it with um, a distributed ledger. So that's all possible. We get into two things here down the corner. The Dido network might be involved with one or more immutable data objects. So that domain might be um, a travel agency or travel. <coughs> and they might have frequent flyer miles, but they also might have, so that's one of their uh, immutable objects. It's kind of like an ICO, a coin, frequent flyer miles. But then they also might be involved with um, uh, <coughs> uh, discounts and all kinds of other things that they're doing. So that would be a different <coughs> immutable data object. So they might have a collection of those that all go into that travel thing, or the power company. Do you have your customer relations and your customer and your billing and that part. And then you have the running of the network and that's a different whole uh, uh, data object or collection of data objects. So you would have that. The, um, and then there could be other networks that you, you need to associate with. So um, back to the travel thing. Uh, American Airlines might be in a different network, and so you need to be able to, they have their own set of distributed ledgers that are keeping track of the American Airlines frequent flyer miles, where you're, which is part of one world, and then you're part of the other world, the other alliance, and that's a different network. So those are different networks. But when you come down to it, you need to, and that these could be cryptocurrencies as well. So one could be Bitcoin, and one could be um, Ethers. Doesn't matter, but they're different networks. So. In that, you need to have an exchange that goes between the different networks. How do I exchange a Bitcoin for an Ether? How do I exchange a Bitcoin for a US dollar? How do I, ex those are exchanges. So I might, uh, I might have an exchange that allows me to exchange credits that I've earned from my solar collectors into paying my bill. And that's one kind of exchange, and that's all within one network. Or it could go between networks. So I want to exchange my American Airlines miles for Marriott miles. And I want to go through the exchange to do that. Um, it could also go to the outside, and I want to buy frequent flyer miles. And so I'm going to take US dollars and convert them into more frequent flyer miles. So these are kind of the components of the thing. When I was listening to JT speak, I thought there's one more community here that I didn't put on the map here that's not represented properly. And that's the, where does the Microsoft play? Where does the IBM play? They are a community, they're going to be offering a, 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 they're kind of an umbrella organization dealing with a lot of the Dido uh, platforms and they want to be able to push those platforms in a direction to make it their lives easier and to be able to collect the metrics and what happens to happen to do that. So there's actually a third community kind of residing there in the ecosystem, which is maybe the ICO, uh, Microsoft Azure's, the IBM Hyperledger's, where they're providing infrastructure and help in how to manage and, and keep these things going. So our general uh, Dido RA is, this is the, the, whole, the whole node. Every node could have all of these things or some of these things, depending on their role. Um, there's the blue side and the green side, and basically the blue side has to deal with the ledger, the primary data object that you're trying to deal with. 
And the green side has to do with the ancillary data, the support data, the oracles, uh, the data you need to get from the oracle. So I'm running an exchange. I need to exchange euros to dollars. Out the, I'm not going to keep the exchange rate inside of my data network. That's done by an exchange in New York or Switzerland or wherever it happens to be. So that I need an oracle to reach out to get that data and bring it back. But that's the ancillary data that supports it. Other kinds of ancillary data which are really kind of important are you can actually distribute your software. So if you have a smart, smart contract, your, your smart contract actually can become ancillary data. So you distribute the ancillary data out and now all of a sudden all the nodes are running the, the new software. Um, do you have any kind of rules that you want to put out there? So you have roles and, and rules for, for how this is going to behave. That could be ancillary data that you send out there that is distributed throughout the nodes and they all have to have a copy of it. Configuration files are one of the easiest ones that people think about. Oh, everybody has to have a configuration file. All the nodes have to have it to describe the environment and that's perfect. So uh, that's, a, that's an ancillary data. That's something that's not part of the main blockchain itself, not, not part of the main um, distributed immutable object. It's part of the support, so ancillary data. So we kind of distributed this, so there's tool, we have tools and interfaces um, that you're going to need. You have to have a secure messaging system because you can't be putting this information out on a wire that, that a wire shark can read. That kind of defeats the whole purpose. Um, you need a distribution software, which is the part that's actually going to distribute the software. That's where the IOTAs and the, the IBM hash graphs, and they're providing all that, that stuff for you, so you pick one of those. And then you have um, these other areas, these other components that you, you can have. Um, so a general node would have all of this. In our, I mean, we were just trying to kind of think of, well, we can have a general node. Uh, you can have a wallet node. We were trying to map the existing uh, Bitcoin type of world into our model to see if it worked. And yes, we said, well, we could have a wallet that has an identity which has to be able to securely, it has to have the core there. Um, then we had a ledger node, and it had to be able to do transactions, identity, and ledger. And, uh, you know, do, is this an absolute thing? No, we were just testing out the model to see if it would work and covering that kind of situation. You might have a smart contract node, which needs ancillary data, which is the smart contract itself. That's not really part of the core distributed uh, mutable object. So in that case, you would have this ancillary data, which might have a smart contract, and a distribution, distributed app of how to run it. Uh, there might be an ancillary node that all it does is support ancillary information, going back and forth for transforms and uh, getting you the latest exchange rates or the stock quotes or whatever it happens to be what you're doing. Um, this was a mining node that was thought, well, okay, a, mining, a miner goes through and verifies. Now, that's not, a, you don't need a miner in all the implementations of Dido. So, for example, you don't have miners, I don't believe, in IOTA. That's, they're miner free, and that's their, that's their beauty. So, not everybody has to have these things, but so we were testing to see if these components really work. Um, and this is the common core. This gets into a little bit of how the uh, ancillary data kind of works. There is the common, there's the node down inside, and there's an oracle that surrounds it, which gets it up into the ancillary data. The ancillary data that, that it's getting does not necessarily come from a distributed, it's not necessarily another data. It could be a relational database. It could be a data feed that's coming off of stock quotes. It could be a GPS system for a jet tracking system. All of those things could be ancillary data. And whether they're in a centralized data, uh, Oracle database type of thing, or whether they're in a series of nodes out there, it doesn't matter. You have to write an Oracle. That Oracle then becomes part of what is the ancillary data that needs to go out there. So you have to define those. This kind of alludes to some of the, the examples of Oracles that you, you need to have. Um, Oracle, there's Oracle SAP down at the bottom, there's a Visa and MasterCard, there's banks, there's <coughs> stock exchanges, um, there's Bitcoin, there's other Dido networks that you might want to have an Oracle to go to that other network when I talk about the exchange, maybe you have to have one of those. Um, 
There's event data, so if something happens, we, we have to we have to we're listening for that event. When that event happens, our Dido has to respond to that event. You know? So that's the kind of stuff that needs to be done in there, the Oracle. Here is a kind of a, the, the list is much bigger than this, but I wanted to kind of give you an idea of the kinds of standards that we felt that a general component, the, the kinds of standards that were applicable to a general component. So you see here all the ISO. I, um, IEC 25,000 series, and they're all about measuring data quality, measuring software quality, measuring uh, the, the, the goodness of your, your design. There's some OMG standards here, um, uh, information technology one, I don't remember that one off the head, but there's structured assurance case model. So how do I assure that this is right? That has, that you should be looking at that, that reduces risk. There's semantics and business vocabulary rules, SBBR. So when I'm writing these rules, am I writing them, misusing the words that I'm using? So I call it a, an account that's really not an account, it's a ledger, whatever it happens to be. So those, those kind of play into there. Um, and that, you know, you think, well, vocabulary and semantics, that's, that's really, I mean, you know, okay, who cares? It's just semantics. But it really does matter because at some point you have to bring things together or somebody who has to audit your code. Mm -hmm. If they have to start from ground zero and take your definition of all what all these things mean, that's an important difference. Um, there's the Unified Architecture Framework, um, the case management. The reason I brought up the case management with the, um, the failed um, uh, dash point was because there was no case management. Bitcoin had no case management in place, and they had to fork. And it was only when, we go back to that community diagram, only when the people in the domain, that left side, were complaining so much because they were using Bitcoin that they went back and they said, oh, there is a problem. And so now we have to fork the Bitcoin. And forking is no, not something any distributed uh, object wants to do. So these are some of the standards that, that we associate with the different components. Financial law, Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, you know, yes, you, you can produce a financial system in distributed ledger, but you can't be ignorant of the laws that still apply. So whether it's HIPAA, if you're doing medical stuff, or whether it's the Dodd-Frank Act or Sarbanes-Oxley, whatever it is, you have to be involved with those, those laws, and those you should be able to, to get to. Um, so here are some, some other standards. These are some of the global data component standards, ECMA script, JavaScript, I mean, most people are using it. So they could be able to chip Kick that off. Yep, I did that, I did that, I did that. XML path language. Oh, yeah, we're using XPath. Oh, we're using Java. Okay, we're using C. Whatever the languages are, you, you, you can do those things. Every time you use a, the reason a standard comes about is because it's a risk mitigator. I call them, it's the, the Wunderkinder phenomenon that is going on. A Wunderkinder is somebody who's a brilliant coder, a brilliant person who comes together with brilliant ideas and builds something brilliant. But they have a tendency to want to ignore what's come before. And they are destined to have their fingers burned. And if they were to look at the standards and start applying some of the standards to them, maybe some of these Wunderkinders wouldn't get burned. But a lot of times when the old gray hairs with 50 years of experience come to them and say, nah, they go, hey, you, you're, you're old, you don't understand the new technology. So that's part of what, what goes on. In summary, most of the components of the data reference architecture have some standard areas needed. There needs a lot of work. Blockchain, software, transforms, wallets. We don't, there's some, some